Welcome to our inaugural Big Technology Subscriber Q&A with industry experts. And today we're going to start talking about one of the things that I'm most interested in in the generative AI revolution, and that's its application to medicine. Yes, medicine. We've heard a lot about how AI can help with drug discovery, with things like AlphaFold. But can we start to see generative AI make its way into the patient and uh, physician experience can patients start to do their own medical care? Will it replace doctors? Will it enhance the coverage that we get? These are all big questions, and there are plenty more that I have that we're going to go over uh, today. And we have an absolutely amazing guest joining us today. Our guest today is Dr. Lloyd Miner. He is the dean of the Stanford University School of Medicine, and he's been he's been there for actually quite some time, for about a decade. So. Um, you have a wealth of experience. You've seen so much change over time. And thank you so much for being here today, Dr. Miner, and helping us kick this one off. Well, thank you very much, Alex. And it's wonderful to be here with you and, and your guests. And um, I'm excited to talk about uh, the applications of AI to healthcare, biomedicine, and life sciences. Um, and I, I do think that the introduction of generative AI, as you said, um, is already an inflection point, but will be an even greater inflection point in the future, given that we're still in the early stages of the evolution and development of generative AI. And I know that that's one of the topics we're going to talk about uh, today in our conversation. Definitely. And um, I should note that we're doing this as a, a subscriber Q&A. So if you, and I'm broadcasting this also on YouTube and to all of our subscribers on Big Technology, just to give you a feel of what this is like, we'll be doing these regularly with the Big Technology audience. So if you're interested in participating in these conversations, just sign up at bigtechnology.com and you'll hear more about the next one coming on February 20th with uh, Bloomberg reporter Kurt Wagner, who's going to talk about his, his new book, about Twitter and the battle between Jack Dorsey and Elon Musk. So two very different conversations, but this will be a fun one to start it off. Look, we're going to talk a lot about AI today, uh, Dr. Miner, but I need to ask you first, it's Vision Pro Week with Apple. Apple is releasing the Vision Pro. There's going to be a lot of conversation about what this device is all about. Um, it's initially being framed as a consumer device, but as these virtual reality devices continue to get more and more uh, uh tested by the market, they always seem to end up in, in enterprise uses, in warehouses and in the medical field. I'm curious, just from your perspective as the Dean of Medicine of Stanford University, um, what, what do you think about the potential for these devices? And are we just going to basically have a long cycle of discussions of where this thing is going to be used, only to eventually end up in a medical application? I think we're already seeing medical applications of virtual reality, augmented reality. Let me just mention one. Uh, here, our neurosurgeons have developed a virtual reality lab to allow them to visualize uh, in, you know, in three dimensions, uh, the structures of the brain, the, uh, the white matter, the vascular structures of the brain prior to performing an operation on the brain. Uh, so, for example, if they're doing an operation to get to an aneurysm that's in one of the deep arteries in the vein, um, there are lots of things that you have to navigate to get to the aneurysm. So they're able to do this to plan the operation in advance uh, with virtual reality or to similarly in terms of removing a tumor. Um, and that already today is is being used in medical education and and in and also in enabling surgeons to actually, if you will, rehearse an operation, rehearse the steps in a surgical procedure before it's actually being performed in the patient. That's uh, that's a true advance. You know, when I was learning anatomy, uh, we we had dissections, but we mainly had to visualize things and reconstruct things in our heads. Um, and it's just so much more effective when you have uh, uh, the, the aid of technology uh, and in particular being able to customize what you're seeing or what you're visualizing based upon an individual set of circumstances, such as the location of an aneurysm or tumor or how uh, the, an image of the brain, for example, maps onto um, uh, a, a, an MRI scan of the brain. Th those are all things that 
that technology has right. brought to us that we didn't have even as recently as a decade ago. I mean, the mixed reality applications sound amazing, being able to layer on like what you're seeing in the scans onto the brain as you operate, or and especially as a learning device. Uh, do, do you anticipate seeing a moment where buying a Vision Pro might become like as standard as a textbook for a Stanford uh, University of Medicals, uh, the Stanford Medical School student? I think that's certainly a possibility uh, when personal computers and, and then iPads were introduced, for example, um, it didn't take long for them to find their ways into uh, medical education, education across the board, but in particular medical education. I think definitely the higher forms of visualization, if you will, more technologically advanced forms of image visualization and image representation will also find uh, a, a very warm home in uh, in medical education and in, in at all different levels. Yeah, that that sound you heard was Apple's stock going up. Um, so let's talk a little <laughs> bit about about the main event. Well, there are going to be lots Apple, and it, you know, obviously they're they're probably going to yeah, be lots of interest others. into this space. So our main event is talking about how AI and other cutting edge technology will be applied in the medical field, especially uh, generative AI. And, you know, Dr. Minor, I got to tell you, a lot of us feel burned hearing about uh, these stories about AI and medicine. For instance, there was like a long, uh, a long running hype cycle that like IBM's Watson can read a, uh, a scan better than a radiologist can. And that didn't really seem to be the case. Now, I think there have been some, there's been some progress where we're starting to get to the point where the technology's, capab technology's capabilities match the hype. But I'm curious from your perspective, because you're looking at this all the time, um, where are we now in terms of like the realistic capabilities, what we can do today versus what we've been told might be possible in the future? I think the technology has matured, as you indicated, but probably probably of equal importance, our expectations have matured. I, I don't think for a moment that even with the remarkable advances in the application of machine learning, deep learning models to the interpretation of radiological images, for example, I don't think for a moment that no matter how advanced those methods become, and I know they will become much more advanced even than they are today, I don't think it's going to displace or put out of business uh, the need for radiologists. What I think it will do in the future is that there will be radiologists who know how to use AI in a responsible way and who use it to improve their efficiency, to improve the accuracy of the image of the interpretations they're doing on images. And those radiologists will be the radiologists of the future uh, in contrast to what I think will be a vanishingly few number of radiologists down the road who say, well, I'm not gonna use AI in my practice at all. Uh, so I think in, in the early days that there was a lot of hype, as you said, about machine learning applications, the applications of say traditional AI as it has evolved as it had evolved up until the introduction of generative AI, that those approaches were going to put diagnostic specialties such as radiology, radiologists and pathologists, you know, out of business or displace them. And and I think but we're seeing even, that's not the case. It's even beyond that. It's not the fact that we haven't gotten to the point where they are going to put radiologists out of a job. It's the point that those capabilities, we don't even know if they're helpful at all. So where, do, where does the technology stand today? Well, the technology in certain areas, particularly with regard to radiology, now, images in radiology, whether or not it's MRI, CT scan, or traditional radiographs, those have been digital for well over a decade. That is, we stopped taking images by film um, you know, many years ago. Therefore, all the data comes in as digital data, making it very amenable for, um, for the application of, of deep learning models, neural networks. Therefore, there have been a lot of advances in, again, in picking up things that, that a radiologist might miss uh, because they're very subtle. Also, in a person who's having longitudinal studies done, that is, multiple different imaging studies over the course of time in order to evaluate whether or not a tumor is progressing or not, um, the AI is going to be able to take, it takes in those images and can very accurately tell 
uh, a radiologist, it's changed by three millimeters or outline it on successive uh, images. Uh, so the applications are here today and I think are already augmenting the quality of care we can provide. Another example, uh, a busy radiologist may be looking at 100, 200 chest x-rays, chest radiographs a day. Maybe there's some in that 200 that were done overnight that need to be looked at immediately because they may have a significant finding on it. Uh, and maybe even in the middle of the night, the finding needs to be triggered when the radiologist perhaps is not in the hospital, finding needs to be triggered for the person, the physician who ordered the, the chest radiograph. AI is very will be very good at prioritizing, flagging things that are at you know, that signal that the patient is at high risk uh, and making sure that that those uh, findings get attended to quickly. Those are just a few of the applications today. I think the utility is there. Uh, how it gets work, how it gets applied to work streams and then adopted in a meaningful way, that that takes time. And institutions will vary in terms of how quickly they move towards that adoption. And by the way, if folks have questions, feel free to either unmute and just ask them or raise your hand and I'll make sure to give you the floor. Uh, but it's okay. So what we've been talking about up until this point has been, we talked about virtual reality. We talked about like the old models, right? The old school models, even though they're still developing, which is the computer vision models that is being used on something like a radiology scan. However, you've come out and you've been very strongly uh, talking about what this new wave of generative AI can actually do for us. And you had some really some some big uh, pronouncements in the Wall Street Journal. You said the changes that are going to occur in the lifetime of people entering medicine today are going to be without parallel. And I'd love to hear from your perspective, just what you think, how you think generative AI plays into that and where you think the potential is for generative AI in the medical field today. I think the potential is several fold. Let me talk about one obvious example. You know, when I went to medical school, not only did I memorize the names of drugs and their mechanisms of action, but also I memorized the dosages of the drugs and how those were weight adjusted or adjusted based upon other characteristics. That's gone away. And of course, when I went to medical school, we still wrote out prescriptions by hand for if a person was an outpatient, gave a, a person a prescription of, on a piece of paper. Uh, in the hospital, we wrote it on an order sheet that was then faxed or sent through a pneumatic tube down to the pharmacy. And those days are gone, blessedly. Now, most prescriptions, most medications are ordered electronically, uh, either directly linking from the physician's office to the pharmacy or in the hospital uh, through an electronic health record system. What has that done? Well, first of all, we should have never been memorizing dosages to medicines. The human brain doesn't keep arbitrary uh, numerical information like that in an accurate way, doesn't store it. Um, and furthermore, by moving to electronic uh, prescription ordering, we've also been able to identify drug-drug interactions. We've been able to accurately dose a medication because we know the patient's height and weight and other uh, characteristics. So rather than a physician or someone else, a pharmacist having to do it longhand with a calculator done automatically. There's been a reduction in medication errors. There's been an improvement in the efficacy of medications because they're ordered more accurately. That's that's a low-hanging fruit example with fairly traditional AI. Now, moving into generative AI, the, the amount of knowledge being generated in biomedical research today is is without parallel, and I don't see it slowing down. The new drugs coming on the market to treat conditions, uh, those continue to increase. The need for physicians in practice to keep up with advances in medical practice also continues to grow. Generative AI brings a lot of that information to the fingertips of learners and to practicing physicians. Um, so if I wanna know, um, you know, what are the latest advances in so-called antibody drug conjugates to treat cancer? Uh, generative AI will bring that information to me very quickly. Now, you still have to be concerned about hallucinations, and we are still early in the generative AI evolution and revolution. Uh, I could do the same thing that I get with a generative AI 
uh, model. I could do the same thing with an internet search, but it would probably take me 30 minutes to an hour, you know, going to the various sources and putting together the information that I found in various papers or through Wikipedia sites or other things like that. With generative AI, you get an assimilation of knowledge in, in a way that, that you can tailor based on the way you ask the questions and the way you continue uh, to interact with uh, with the generative AI program. That, that's, to me, what is what is revolutionary. It then causes us as medical educators to rethink um, what should be memorized, what should a physician carry around in their active working memory and knowledge base, and what should people be going to, uh, to a source, a curated source for sure, uh, to get information when, when they don't know or understand things. Also, the, the other thing that generative AI offers is the ability, and this is, and I know we're going to talk about privacy today, but this is a very important area to talk about privacy. But when a generative AI model is brought into a closed system, such as a healthcare system where the data is protected, you know, constantly we're seeing patients that have a complex constellation of symptoms that don't quite fit what we'd seen before. And we're trained as physicians and as specialists, you're trained to put together the pieces and come up with a probable diagnosis. Uh, but with, with generative AI, with the approaches that are used in, in transformer models, there can be data brought in from various different sources in a way customized to the query. In other words, customized to the patient you're asking about. It gives it potentially gives the, the physician much greater insight into the things that they should be thinking about in making a diagnosis or what they should be doing in terms of ordering tests in order to clarify the diagnosis that we haven't had before. We had to rely upon our knowledge or talking to other specialists. There wasn't really a source we could go to to say, well, I have someone who has these five different conditions, and I don't know how they're interacting with each other in order to produce what is leading them to come to see me today. Generative AI already can really help with that. Great. Um, we have an awesome question from Margie here. Margie, do you want to um, sh share your question with Dr. Miner? Sure. So going back to what you discussed with diagnostic imaging and the most recent examples about helping physicians decide what tests to order, how do you see the new AI capabilities being delivered? Is it likely to come through existing software and hardware tools and professional associations, or is it likely to come from new companies and new players? Well, thank you, Margie. I think, I think it's a great question. I believe it's going to come from all of the above. Now, most healthcare delivery systems today are, are really the, the, the care is coordinated, archived, and directed through electronic health record systems. Um, the, the dominant one in the United States is Epic. Cerner also has a system. Uh, but in order for generative AI really to get into the flow of how care is delivered in these larger health systems, it's going to need to integrate with the electronic health record system because the electronic health record system is where all the lab values, all the radiology images and reports, where everything else about the patient's history and, and examination and findings are stored. So there'll have to be that interface, but, but and there are many ways that that interface can be achieved. I think every health system is going to need to make a decision while we're going through this rollout period and rapid evolution period. Every health system is going to need to make a decision about what they want to bring into their system, what they can support, because it isn't just matter a matter of loading the app or having it be compatible with an electronic health record. It's going to have to be supported. People are going to have to be trained on it. We will go through a period, I believe, where um, there will be a, a period of flux where there isn't just one standard approach. I think to back to your question about is this going to be mainly big tech firms is this going to be um uh is this going to be startups it's going to be all of the above certainly i think there is a it, it is a role for um for a vibrant startup ecosystem and we're already seeing that 
Does does the electronic medical record then become sort of the data that's used to train a foundational model that doctors can use when they think about how to use these uh, LLMs for care? And if so, I mean, you mentioned privacy earlier. Do we all then sort of like automatically consent to having our health data used to train these new medical LLMs? And what are the ethical implications there? Great question. Well, already today, um, health systems are able to license the model into their system. So the data doesn't leave the system, but the model can be used and trained based on data in the system. So it protects privacy um, and it allows a health system to offer the type of um, uh, capabilities that we were talking about before, such as if you have a complicated patient, how do you ask the model a question about things that you should be thinking about when you're ordering diagnostic studies or you're thinking about what treatments you're going to prescribe? So it, it, it it's a way of gaining the power of a foundation model, a transformer-based model, but to do it in a closed system so data's not leaving the system, uh, which then could be used to identify someone I think that's we're, we're going to see more and more examples of that. Um, we'll also see more improved mechanisms of de-identifying data that can then be used uh, to train foundation models. But this the, the issue of privacy is absolutely central to everything we're talking about. And I I think there was a you know there was a study last year that the Pew uh, Charitable Trust did where they simply asked people, "Do you trust?" the application of AI to your health records. And, you know, not surprisingly, the majority of people said no. And partly the reason is we haven't, you know, we haven't talked about how AI can be used responsibly, can be used in a way that, that protects privacy and that improves the delivery of care. Again, back to the example I, I mentioned that AI is being used today, pretty much every medication that's being prescribed is in some way being checked by an AI-based system to make sure the dosage is correct and that there aren't adverse interactions with any of the other medications that have been prescribed. I mean, that's a good thing for all of us. But um, as we roll out more and more sophisticated models, and as those models start to take into to account more and more data, such as data from social media, even a query that doesn't have patient identifying information in it, even a query can potentially, if if the data is in a broader ecosystem, can potentially lead to the identification of a person. And that's what we absolutely want to prevent. Right. And Margie, you had another question about training that I thought was really good. Is this a good time to ask that one? The skills and yes, training I, you would um, need? Yeah, yeah. And I was, in your previous answer, I thought about the training then is huge <laughs> and the need for that. And I work in reporting about higher education. So I've been really curious what skills are needed for the teams who are going to be working on this because typically in other areas we see a breadth of skills are needed not just the scientific skills or the medical skills or the technological skills but you know people to manage projects and synthesize information so i know that's very broad but for the teams that are leading these efforts and making these decisions what types of skills need to be included it's a great question, Margie, and I think there are skills at all different levels. First, there's the skills, they're the skills of the of, of the medical workforce, of, of physicians. And one of the things that, that we've tried to do in our medical school, we during the preclinical years of medical education at Stanford, we pretty much follow the same calendar as the rest of the university. And we encourage our students uh, to take courses in other areas of the university. So we have students uh, that are taking advanced computer science courses, other engineering courses, as well as courses from around the university. It's going to take a physician workforce uh, with diverse skills, some in that workforce who have deep skills uh, at, 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 in the technology and can sit down and, and be conversant in a meaningful way uh, with the most sophisticated computer scientists that are driving uh, the the future of of AI and all of its forms, and then it's going to take physicians who have a basic level of comfort uh, with how to responsibly use these models, and to know when they can be integrated into their practice and when you know you need to maintain a deep degree of skepticism. 
the other thing for health systems, already health systems spend you know, significant amounts on technology in, in delivery systems. And I don't think that's going to go down in, in any in, any time in the near future. In fact, if anything, probably we'll be spending more on, on technology and on hiring the experts that you just described in order to implement the technology and refine it within the system. It is going to be different than, than the applications of technology where you don't have such sensitive data as we do in healthcare. Uh, so we will have, I think, situations where each system is reinventing the wheel uh, because the ability to aggregate large amounts of data is going to be limited because of the urgent need to protect privacy. What about how it uh, changes and then um, might make redundant some of the frontline uh, health healthcare workers? So I'm gonna tee you up, Kim, for a question here. Thank you. Yes, so I'm a nurse, and I feel like this is a question that we have been discussing for a couple of years now. Um, just like, how do you think uh, will AI influence nursing? Are there going to be any use cases? Um, and how will it change nursing? Because we always feel like um, the human interaction is, is just such a big part of um, treatment in hospitals. Yes, Kim, I completely agree with you. I think the human interaction, the, the interaction that nurses have with their patients is absolutely critical. What I hope AI will do is to enable nurses and other health professionals to spend more time in that human interaction, less time doing charting, um, less time um, with the electronic health record, because a lot of that is occurring in the background and that the patient and the nurse is able to spend more time and more quality time with each individual patient. And I think that's that's realistic. I think that that also applies to physicians. I think we've all had the experience of, of uh, going in to, to see a physician and immediately the physician is typing on the computer for the electronic health record. I mean, that really should go away. We ought to have a system where uh, those conversations are are being you know, taken in by AI, and before the end of the visit, there's a note describing the visit that the physician and the patient can review, um, and um, and then it isn't as if the recording of the session gets saved. Maybe that is immediately deleted as soon as the note is agreed upon and finalized. So that protects privacy, but it 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 also eliminates this step of which is really taking attention away from the patient. You, you can't really type and attend to the patient at the same time. We can try, but it's not the same thing. And I think that applies to nursing as well. Nurses, in my view, are gonna play an increasingly important role in the delivery of healthcare because the patients we treat are going to be sicker and sicker uh, as, as, we, as the population gets older, as we get better, at managing um, complex chronic diseases, uh, the need for highly skilled, trained nurses that really interact with the patient more than really any other healthcare provider, as you're certainly aware, that need is going to grow. I don't think it's going to decrease. So, uh, Dr. Minor, so I, I'll tell you that that hearing you talk about how AI can help, especially gender AI can help with charting, uh, really hits home. My father is a podiatrist. Um, and he spent, I, he spends maybe because he's still working, maybe I'm going to say 30% of his waking hours doing paperwork. And I think that like, that probably is not an anomaly. And you have like two options, right? You record the patient interaction, you listen back, you do the charts, or you literally don't look at the patient and just type as you go and try to live a normal life. Both of those outcomes, both of those, uh, uh processes are terrible. And there's a chance that this can really help there. It's not elegant. It's not like the sexiest application of this technology, you know, saying how it's good, but, but the amount of care and the amount of like living that a doctor can do on both ends is it, it can be just totally revolutionized with a little bit of technology here. I completely agree. I think you stated it really well. Okay, great. Uh, by the way, John, or I think we had David on the call. If you have a question, feel free to 
to drop it in. Um, I wanted to talk also with you, Dr. Miner, a little bit about how this will work uh, practically. So like in practical use cases. So, okay, it's one thing if it will save doctors a little bit of time by being able to go to a chat bot and talk about treatments and have that that model built on something like uh, the electronic medical record system of Epic, for instance. But it's more than just a time saver, right? It is uh, uh, being able to handle a breadth of cases that a doctor wouldn't have had access to otherwise. And you talk a little bit about in this Wall Street Journal article or, or Q&A that you did, um, you said one of the first set of goals that would be pleasing and affirming would be if a physician in practice in rural America had the same access to analytic information and diagnostic information that a physician in an academic medical center does. Can you talk a little bit about the disparity that exists in terms of the access to information among different practicing physicians and then how AI might be able to level the playing field there? Sure, I, I think of a few obvious examples and th these are areas where the technology, which is both based upon the hardware, that is how information is taken in <clears throat> regarding uh, a patient, regarding a certain aspect of health, so the interaction of the hardware and then the AI or the software. Let me mention two. Uh, one is in dermatology. <clears throat> you know, skin skin lesions, uh, like knowing whether or not a mole could be a cancer, a melanoma, whether or not it's it's benign. Dermatologists trained for years on that uh, to make that distinction. And sometimes the distinctions are very subtle. And knowing when a person should be referred to have a biopsy of a skin lesion or when it's very, very likely to be benign and there's no need to biopsy it. That's a difficult determination to be to be made. Now, imagine a physician and a patient in rural America where it may be a two, three hour drive to get to the nearest dermatologist. And furthermore, that dermatologist may be so busy they don't have an appointment for a month, two months. That physician needs to be able to accurately make a determination about, is this very likely to be a benign lesion of the skin? And therefore we can watch it. I don't need to refer the person to a dermatologist today, or is this highly suspicious? So I really need to get the patient to the dermatologist. Now there's technology to help with that. Um, the FDA has approved devices that help to make that distinction and, and assign a probability score. Uh, and that that it improves the, the access to care. It improves health equity uh, because it's making a knowledge base, albeit in this case through technology, uh, both the imaging technology and also the AI technology, making a knowledge base available uh, to, to someone who, by virtue of their specialty and where they're practicing, they may not have the same knowledge base as a dermatologist that's seeing, you know, 20 or more skin lesions a day and is trained for years to be able to make the distinction. Dermatology is one example. Another example is listening to the heart with a stethoscope. Uh, we're all trained to do that, but some heart murmurs can be very subtle. And now there are AI driven stethoscopes, if you will, uh, that provide an uh, you know, in a, in real time, an indication to the physician, uh, this patient may have mitral regurgitation and probably needs to have an echocardiogram or to be seen by a cardiologist, or these are perfectly normal heart sounds. Um, we're still going to have, we're going to need to train people, train physicians to, uh, to look at skin lesions and have a knowledge of of what could be suspicious or what isn't. We're certainly gonna to have to train physicians in the future to continue to be able to use a stethoscope, but we're going to have these tools uh, that improve uh, the knowledge base in real time that a physician in practice is able to bring to the patient that they're seeing in front of them. And that to me is a great boost to healthcare. And in particular, where it's gonna have the, the biggest impact, I believe, is in areas that, that simply don't have the same sort of specialty access uh, that that a city has. Even within cities, uh, right. there are certain neighborhoods that that don't have that sort of access. Uh, so I view that th these advances be, as being transformative uh, at bringing equity in healthcare delivery. 
Don't you think that these advances belong in the hands of patients as well? I think we're doing a decent job with WebMD, a decent job. I mean, it says I have a scratchy throat and then I might have Ebola, but let's put that aside. It does help us do some research and actually come to doctors and say, hey, I think it might be this. And every now and again, we're right. We're going to get way better at this if we have access to these chatbots and are able to describe our symptoms and that can actually come into the ER or come into a physician's office and maybe even show them a printout of what the chatbot says. And we, that means we start maybe not at third base, but at second base when it comes to our treatment regime. I agree with you completely. In fact, earlier in my career, um, I'm a, a neurotologist, so uh, my focus was on the inner ear, the balance system, and, and hearing and balance. And I described a, an inner ear condition that when we we you know we described it, we wrote papers that validated others in in my field learned how to make this diagnosis. But for several years there, after we, we published the papers and were starting to do the surgery to fix the condition, a lot of the patients that came to see me with the condition had diagnosed themselves through doing a Google search uh, with the symptoms that are characteristic of this syndrome. And they got a link to one of our papers or to our website. Sometimes it, 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 it's been easy to criticize Dr. Google and certainly you want to have a degree of skepticism on the information you receive from any source. But I think making, to your point, putting more information in the hands of patients and ultimately putting better technology in the hands of patients, such as, um, you know, the, the examples we just mentioned, I think it's a very good thing. And it will continue uh, to improve uh, health because at, at the end of the day, the responsibility for health rests primarily with the patient. Uh, we as health professionals have a huge responsibility in partnering with patients, uh, but enabling each of us to exert greater control and responsibility over our health and our health care is a good thing. So we have the dean of uh, Stanford University School of Medicine here. So I have to ask you about Andrew Huberman. Okay. So I mean, there. So I mean, his rise as someone who's led people to take care of their health. Um, it it does. It's very interesting because you've given talks before where you've talked about you have a choice. You can do health care or you can do sick care, and it's much better to have people take care of themselves. Um, you know when you know to make to ensure that they're healthy versus coming to the doctor's office when you're sick. I just wonder why it's taken a podcast to get so many millions of people interested in that, and um, and and what you think. Maybe I'm you know sort of not giving the medical field it's due here, but what, what you think the effects are and, and whether you view this as a good thing. Yes, I think it's a good thing. I think that each of us increasing our knowledge about our health, about the functions of our body, about how we can take steps to improve the care we provide to ourselves. All of that is absolutely good. Back to your question about why did it take us so long? I think there's several reasons. One is that we traditionally in American medicine um, all too commonly, we've viewed the patient in a passive way. I think that's changing. I think it has changed. And I think it continues to change. We have to see the patient as an active participant. And we have to see the patient as ultimately the person who is, uh, who is responsible. And our role is to help the patient in any way we can. But a lot of traditional medicine has been with the assumption that uh, the patient is passive. And I think a lot of Americans have bought into that. Namely, um, if they get sick, they'll go to the doctor, they'll get a medicine and it'll take care of it. We haven't in America traditionally emphasized prevention as much as we should. Uh, we traditionally have not emphasized nutrition as much as we now do and as we should continue to in the future. So those are some of the reasons. The other the other thing that I think is brought out by um, Andrew Huberman's podcast and by others is there's a great need to communicate, and um, the better we are at communicating, communication is not trivial. It's it's a skill that we have to learn and and master and continue to get better at. Uh, but traditionally, particularly, I think, related to health and medicine, we haven't put as much emphasis on training people to communicate either one-on-one -on -one or through larger audiences as we need to moving forward. Okay.
Love it. Um, let's do a couple of shout outs to some things that you're working on before we head out. First of all, we have uh, Raise Health, which you're working on with Dr. Fei Fei Lee. Can you talk a little bit about what that's all about? Sure. Race Health stands for Responsible AI for Safe and Equitable Health. And um, we, we started this initiative back in June of 2023 when it was clear that, in particular, generative AI was going to have a major impact on healthcare, biomedicine, life sciences. And given who we are at Stanford with extraordinary strengths in computer science and, and AI writ large, and with... Um, an outstanding academic medical center that covers the gamut from uh, early stage curiosity driven research all the way through translation research and care delivery that we were we were a, a great place to uh, to start an initiative like this and to see our responsibility really to advance the responsible application of AI into healthcare but to do that in a way that brought in constituents um, constituents from other institutions, but also the public to better understand the opportunities and the challenges and risks of the deployment of AI. Also, another goal of Raise Health is to form a curated list and body of knowledge about how AI is being deployed today in various health systems uh, related to discovery or related to the delivery of care. There needs to be a central repository of information so uh, the public reporters others can go to and say i want to know where where are there ai driven clinical trials in this area um, and be able to get some indication of where those are taking place that's another goal of raise health and then the third goal is to really lead and driving the technology and its safe and responsible application in our healthcare delivery system and beyond. Those are the goals of Raise Health. And it, it this is very, it's been a very exciting rollout. We're still in the relatively early stages, but already beginning to see um, see progress. And uh, there's some conferences coming up and other things that uh, we feel are gonna be very impactful. That's great. And such an impactful early day, such, in the early days of such an impactful technology, that stuff is absolutely needed. Okay, last question for you. You're working to print, or your goal is to print a human heart and put it in a pig. Uh, talk a little bit about what it's like to print organs, how we, how far along we are, and why we're doing that. Well, one of the things I love about my job is I work with such incredibly innovative and creative people. And the work that you mentioned uh, is work of uh, Professor Mark Schuyler Scott and other colleagues we now 3D print things commonly. We can 3D print shoes. We can 3D print dentures. Uh, those are all physical materials. Mark Schuyler Scott and other colleagues worked out ways to 3D print cells and to form structures and functioning organs uh, based upon a technology that has many similarities to uh, the 3D printing of physical objects. There, uh, it, it sounds almost like science fiction, right. but... Uh, it's it's very much within the grasp. Uh, this work has attracted the attention of, of major funding agencies, and I do believe that we'll we'll have very creative and effective approaches to organ transplantation, to uh, congenital heart disease, the treatment of congenital heart disease, for example. Many forms of congenital heart disease result in a defect in one chamber of the heart. Uh, if we, if we had ways of correcting that one chamber and making the overall heart work more closely to normal, then that could reduce the need, for example, for a complete heart transplantation. There are lots of different ways that this technology is going to evolve and be perfected over time. Um, and I'm pleased that, that we have folks here who are really driving this revolution. Yeah, it does sound, I mean, it sounds like science fiction, but to, to think that this stuff is actually like making progress in a lab is just so cool. And, and um, just to sum up, I, I totally think you're right. The communication side of this is so important, especially in a moment where people are dealing with such uncertainty, but also the potential for great progress to be able to have you come on to, you know, this discussion and share your thoughts and take some questions from us. We can't thank you enough for it. Really appreciate you, you. being here and helping us kick this off. And we hope to have you back sometime soon. Great. It's been great 
being with you. Thank you for inviting me. Awesome. Thanks for being here. And then last thing, do you have a place that people can follow your work and Stanford's work if they're interested in hearing more? You know, we have a, a website, a Stanford Medicine website. Um, and if you, you go to that, uh, we publish updates. Um, I have a podcast, The Minor Consult. Uh, but the, the website is updated regularly on things that are coming out uh, from us communications-wise. Um, you can also link to various different sites in the Stanford Medicine uh, internet ecosystem in order to find out additional information about clinical trials or other things of that nature. Awesome. Dr. Meyer, thank you so much. Can't thank you enough for being here. And thanks to everybody who came here, participated, asked some questions, or just watched uh, you know, either here or on YouTube or within Substack. You guys are awesome. Thanks again. And we'll do this again, actually, uh, in about 20 days. All right. Great. Take care. Thank you. Thanks again.